Hello and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Judith Sears Poisson and I'll be your host. Our webinar today is on the effects of immigration enforcement on vulnerable individuals and communities and we're fortunate to have three wonderful speakers today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Michael T. Light, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an IRP affiliate. He'll start us off with an examination of whether immigration enforcement exacerbates racial and ethnic inequality under the law. Then we'll hear from Dr. Joaquin Rubalcaba, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Public Policy at UNC Chapel Hill. He'll share the impact of immigration enforcement on the labor supply, particularly as it relates to Hispanic youth in mixed status families. And finally, we'll turn to Dr. Assad El Assad, who's an assistant professor of sociology at Stanford University and a faculty affiliate of the Stanford Center for Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity. He'll share his insights from his recently released book, Engage and Evade, How Latino Immigrant Families Manage Surveillance in Everyday Life that was published by Princeton University Press. Again, thank you all for being here. This webinar is supported in part by funding from the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. But views expressed by our speakers don't necessarily represent the opinions or policies of that office or of any other sponsor, including the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have an hour today, and after we hear from each of our presenters, we'll spend the last 10 minutes or so at the end for live Q&A. You can type those in through the Q&A box. We did get quite a few questions submitted as people registered, so we'll be queuing some of those up as well. I hope you'll also feel free to participate through the chat. We love to know who you are and what you're thinking about. And I want to let you know that we have closed captions enabled, so you can toggle those on and off at the bottom of your screen. We'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and you'll receive a link to those by email. So with that, thank you again for being here, and we'll get started with Professor Light. Yep, I started talking before unmuting. That's my fault. Uh, rookie Zoom mistake. So one, thank you very much, uh, Judith and IRP, for hosting this event, and also thank you to everyone in attendance. Um, it's great to see so many people and so many people registered. So I know we're short on time, so I want to be very cognizant of people's time. So I will just jump right in, and I'm confident I'll probably have to gloss over some of the details here, um, but I'll try to be as um, equal uh, points uh, useful and uh, without being overly wordy. So this, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, I think, a really uh, salient question uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing play out, uh, not just in the context of our study, but in the context of just sort of broader public dialogue. And that is, does immigration enforcement exacerbate racial inequality under the law? And here we're looking at sort of two different aspects. We're looking at both policing, and we're also looking at case processing uh, in this study. And so, again, many of you on this call will be familiar with this sort of general term of crimmigration. Again, the, 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 the idea behind this is just a, a sort of uh, an increasing uh, intermingling of criminal law enforcement with immigration enforcement, that these systems are now mo much more interconnected than any point in U.S. history. And by far, I would say the program that's most responsible for this was the Secure Communities Program, often referred to as ESCOM. And ESCOM was a nationwide local immigration initiative that rolled out the county level between 2008 and 2012. So in 2008, it was a pilot program. Uh, it was about in about 12 to 13 counties. By the end of 2012, it was in every county in the United States. And the basic principle behind ESCOM was that fingerprints that are routinely taken by local law enforcement at booking, so again, this is part of the routine booking procedure, would automatically be sent to the Department of Homeland Security. And so what's really important about this program is that it didn't change anything in policing. Again, these records were already being recorded. What it did do is, so again, what happens is, is people are booked into uh, local processing, and then those records are usually sent to the FBI, essentially to see if somebody has a warrant in another state. But once the FBI has that data, what Secure Communities did was it made it so that that data would then be shared with the Department of Homeland Security. So the fact that it didn't require any changing of policing, um, I think is important, and, I, and you'll see why. Now, again, from the onset that many of these sort of programs, including ESCOM, uh, there's been very strong claims about the consequences of immigration enforcement. And the, one of the core critiques, and again, we saw this play out in SB 1070, and we're seeing it play out right now in Texas's SB 4, right? It's playing out before uh, many of the federal courts, and that it's going to lead to racial profiling, right? So you see here some quotes about 
uh, the consequence of immigration enforcement. And again, fairly strong in terms of that's going to lead to racial profiling. Now, I would say that these claims are more often stated rather than demonstrated. And there's actually not as much research um, on this question of does actually immigration enforcement lead to racial profiling? And so that was essentially the question we wanted to answer in this study, is we use detailed case information from both California and Texas between 2006 and 2012. So we have two years before ESCOM is rolled out, and then we have the entirety of the rollout of ESCOM. And what we ask is, is did the implementation of secure communities lead to ethnic inequalities in arrest? And did ESCOM exacerbate case processing disparities? So again, after arrest, were you charged? Were you incarcerated? Were you convicted? Um, we ask, how did ESCOM or did ESCOM change any case processing for both ethnic minorities and non-U.S. citizens? And again, I think many people will be familiar with some of the key. I mean, we chose Texas and California for a variety of reasons. One, because they're the two largest foreign-born populations in the United States. Uh, they're both, again, sizable immigrant populations. They both process uh, large immigrant populations through their criminal justice systems. However, they've taken very different approaches to what you would call the increasing use of uh, local criminal justice for immigration enforcement. So Texas has been a very avid uh, and again, they're trying to ramp up their amount of uh, um, collaboration with immigration enforcement. And California's gone the exact opposite way. California's actually instituted many policies to try and sort of decouple, to try and disconnect um, their criminal justice system from immigration enforcement. So these are really useful uh, uh, comparative uh, sort of research sites. Now, we raised some questions. Essentially, the, the point of this is to say we're not exactly sure it's not obvious that ESCOM would lead to the targeting of ethnic minorities. And there's a couple of reasons. One is that, um, again, it sort of assumes that uh, police are looking for a reason to sort of engage in ethnic profiling. And so once they uh, sort of had this idea of, oh, we're not, maybe we could try and get them on immigration offenses, that they would be uh, uh, sort of keen to uh, embrace that. But again, that, that sort of uh, neglects the fact that many jurisdictions really did not embrace immigration enforcement. Again, the California Trust Act of 2013, which is one of the um, policies, state, pol state laws passed in California, again, trying to decouple uh, immigration enforcement from t California's criminal law, uh, criminal justice system. It was passed explicitly in response to ESCOM, basically saying that they thought that ESCOM went too far, that they didn't like that individuals were being flagged for deportation for relatively minor offenses. Um, moreover, many jurisdictions who want to engage in uh, 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 immigration enforcement already had the opportunity to do so prior to this. Okay, so again, so th th there's reasons to think that maybe. Uh, um, it wouldn't lead to ethnic uh, ethnic inequality. However, there are reasons to think that it may be consequential for non-U.S. citizens, at least following the initial arrest. And that is because it's after the initial arrest, when somebody's immigration status is actually checked, that something uh, like uh, immigration status or citizenship status is likely to be consequential. And we think there's a few reasons for that. One is once you know that somebody is a non-U.S. citizen, uh, now you're, they're much more likely to be flagged for deportation. Okay, and there's a couple of reasons why that could be consequential. One, again, prosecutors may think, okay, great, I'm going to try and make sure this person's convicted of a charge that leads to deportation. Or again, in the case, let's assume you have a judge who simply is totally agnostic to somebody's immigration status. The fact that they think this person's likely to face deportation almost certainly shifts the logic of punishment. And that is that if I don't think you're going to be in the country for very long, I'm not going to give you, say, a work release program. I'm not going to put you in probation for three years when I don't think you can fulfill that sentence. So there's reasons to think that the case processing of non-U.S. citizens changed. And that's essentially what we try to test in this study. So again, we have uh, data from California and Texas. That's really important. We have the entire universe of criminal arrests in both of these states. We have every misdemeanor arrest and every uh, um, felony arrest in both states during this time. So it's a tremendous amount of data that we have, okay? And so the, our core idea behind this is what's called a difference in difference strategy. And the intuition behind this is very straightforward, is we can compare the same county to itself before and after the ESCOM program is rolled out. And then we can compare that to another county later on before and after. So we can see how does this change as ESCOM rolls out, okay? So again, we have two different stages to this analysis. The first one looks at arrests. And again, essentially what we're looking at here is did the percent of arrests that involve Latinos or Hispanics change during this period? Again, if ESCOM had an effect, it likely shifted uh, the focus for law enforcement. And so what we look at is, is that the case? Do Hispanics now occupy a larger share of the pie 
uh, of arrests in the immediate aftermath of ESCOM. And then the second stage, we look at things like, were you charged? Were you convicted? And were you incarcerated? And again, I'll, I'll gloss over some of the details here, but I'm happy to answer these in the Q&A. We have a tremendous number of rich controls to try and compare like with like. So we can actually say, this similarly situated, you know, a uh, non-U.S. citizen compared to a similarly situated U.S. citizen, and what was their likelihood of conviction? So I'll jump right into the results again. I want to make sure I'm cognizant of people's time. Okay, the first one is that we find no evidence that ethnic inequalities and in arrest increased. In fact, for we look at all arrests, we look at felony arrests, we look at misdemeanor arrests, we look at traffic arrests, and we think those latter two are really important because they involve much more discretion, right? So misdemeanor arrests involve a lot of police discretion. Same with traffic arrests. So if we were going to see ethnic inequality as a result of ESCOM, we'd probably see them in those offenses, but we don't see them there. In fact, what we see is that the share of uh, uh, Hispanics that are the, the percent of, of arrests that involve uh, Latinos after ESCOM actually went down very slightly. Again, these results are statistically significant, but substantively quite small. Again, this these are percentage differences. So this would be 0.08%, um, excuse me, 0.8%. Let me clarify. So what we see is that the uh, the share that involved Hispanics in Texas in terms of arrests actually went down. That's kind of suggest or consistent with, I think, Assad's uh, book, which suggests that sometimes immigration enforcement leads people to pull back. So people perhaps stopped driving as much, had really strong incentives to avoid criminal justice authorities at all. In California, we see no effect whatsoever, that the, the percent of arrests involving Latinos it was completely unaffected by the rollout of ESCOM. So now let's look at case processing. There's a couple things to look at. One is, again, consistent with a lot of prior research. In Texas, we see that Latinos were more likely to be charged, they're more likely to be convicted, and they're more likely to be incarcerated. Now, this is prior to ESCOM. So again, these are sort of ethnic disparities that are already well established in the in the literature. Okay. However, after ESCOM, we find that nothing changes in terms of the treatment of Latino defendants. So while we saw disparities beforehand, we didn't see any change in disparities involving Latinos. And we find the exact same thing in California as well. Essentially that uh, uh, we didn't see any change in the, the legal treatment of Latinos following um, the implementation of ESCOM. So again, to recap what we've seen so far, we don't see any change in the percentage of arrests that involve Latinos because of ESCOM, and we don't see any change in case processing involving Latinos because of ESCOM. But we do see action when we look at non-U.S. citizens specifically. So here we're looking at, again, we see that prior to ESCOM, non-U.S. citizens are more likely to be convicted and they're more likely to be incarcerated. So again, similarly situated. So similar criminal histories, similar types of arrests, more likely to be convicted and more likely to be incarcerated. And in Texas, what we find, and we find similar results in California, just less pronounced, more likely to be convicted, more likely to be incarcerated. In Texas, we find that in the immediate aftermath of ESCOM, these disparities increase uh, considerably. So again, these effects would be additive. So what we find is that it was a, essentially a four percentage point gap in the likelihood of conviction prior to ESCOM jumps now to a seven and a half percentage point gap. And same thing with incarceration. It goes from about 5% to about 10%. Okay. So again, in Texas, that really embraced the aims of ESCOM. We see that the punishment of non-U.S. citizens became immediately more punitive in the aftermath of ESCOM. In Texas, again, ESCOM really didn't have an effect. Okay, so it didn't have an effect on Latinos, and it really didn't seem to change the case processing for non-U.S. citizens um, as it rolled out. Okay, so and again, just to give you a sense of the substantive significance of these findings, we're looking at the results for uh, Texas here. And I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. So you see is that prior to ESCOM, there's about a five percentage point gap in the likelihood of being convicted. And again, this is adjusting for criminal history and those types of things. And then again, right after ESCOM, we see a 10 percentage point gap open up. So again, these are really significant in terms of the likelihood of being incarcerated. The, these citizenship differences tend to be much bigger than differences we see between say white and black defendants, just to give an example. So some of our takeaways here is, you know, we really think it sort of recalibrates our understanding of sort of the scope, target, and impact of immigration enforcement, and that really we don't find much evidence of ethnic disparities in policing or case processing um, that they increased due to ESCOM, right? So there's not much evidence to suggest that ESCOM, at least in Texas and California, um, led to this increase in sort of racial profiling amongst police or the increased use of sort of ethnicity at punishment. However, that doesn't mean ESCOM was inconsequential. What we find is that it's it's ESCOM was highly consequential, but for non-U.S. citizens and only in the state of Texas, which really embraced the sort of core aims of immigration enforcement in their uh, local law enforcement. So I want to be cognizant. I'm going to gloss over a few of these other ones. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for both my other panelists and then also uh, for the Q&A. So with that, I know I spoke almost certainly far too fast.
but I hope uh, that was useful and I'm interested to hear people's uh, comments and questions. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for that, Michael. And now we will move on to Professor Joaquin Rubalcaba. All right, can you hear me now? And can you see my slides? Nope. How about now? Yes. But perfect, we, perfect. Yes, we can't see you, but we can see your oh. slides. Yes. All right, let me, uh, um, there, there we go, okay. All right, sorry, um, rookie mistake on, on the Zoom again. Um, but uh, very much like Michael, I'm gonna try to uh, go through this as, as quickly as possible to, and, and save as much time as possible. Um, so the project that, or the study that I'm presenting today is uh, titled the Immigration Enforcement and Labor Supply, uh, particularly for Hispanic youth in mixed status families. Uh, this paper is now published. Um, uh, my co-author, Jose Buccelli and Camila Morales. Um, and I also wanna thank the Center for uh, Growth and Opportunity as well as the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity for the development of this particular project. Uh, this project, uh, this study in particular, is part of a much larger project to understand um, the broader consequences of immigration enforcement on, on youth within mixed status family. Uh, when we look at uh, immigration enforcement, in two, just in 2019 alone, um, we, there's a, a startling number of, of individuals that were removed, uh, individuals that were arrested under detainer request, and then individuals that were arrested under the, the, what we call these administrative arrests, uh, just in 2019 alone. But when we look over the, over the time period uh, of, of, of our observation for our study, between 2014 and 2018, uh, we see uh, that there were approximately 500,000 uh, uh, non-citizens who were deported. 97% uh, of those were Latino. Uh, and and when when asked uh, about 140,000 of those reported to having at least one U.S. born child, uh, and on average there's about 2.3 children within uh, within each of these households. So you can you can quickly see that's about 300,000 U.S. born children that um, are facing some type of family uh, separation overall. Um, just to kind of uh, get a, a grasp on the size uh, uh, or the population of or the number of, of U.S. born children that are in mixed status families, uh, anywhere from about 15 to 11 percent for um, uh, children uh, to adolescent youth. Um, that's approximately 8 uh, million individuals between the ages of 0 and 14, or about uh, 12 million between uh, the ages of 0 and 24. So this is a, a, a relatively significant uh, a proportion of the population. Uh, and something interesting as well is, is, is thinking beyond uh, mixed status families in terms of, of parents and, and children, but also there are, are about uh, approximately 3% of the total number of U.S. born children in the U.S. Uh, in mixed status family, uh, families that have at least one non-citizen sibling. So not only is this vertically integrated, but mixed status families are also horizontally integrated uh, and it's something that we're looking into in other studies as well. Um, so just to kind of like understand better about the typology of mixed-status family that we're using in this particular study. Now, mixed-status families can get very complicated when you're thinking about it vertically and horizontally, and as well as the extensiveness of, of non-citizenship or mixed-status families. Um, in this particular study, all that we are looking at are U.S.-born children with at least one uh, non-citizen parent. Um, now, with, with this particular definition in mind, uh, what we can start to see from anecdotal evidence is that these children in general are facing this transition from adolescence to adulthood much more sooner than uh, their U.S. born counterparts with U.S. born parents, right? So these children are being asked to translate uh, um, uh, for their parents, read bills, fill out documents, and under, understand and navigate society in different ways than their U.S. born counterparts. Um, when we look at some of the consequences of this, uh, in terms of like what is the impact of this additional burden on these children, as well as immigration enforcement, we see that U.S. born children in mixed status families during periods of heightened immigration enforcement are facing increased rates of poverty, uh, um, uh, increased rates of, of, of missed schools and, and delayed uh, academic achievement, as well as a chilling effect on um, social program utilization. But this is a symptom of what's happening within the household overall. So when we look at the parents or uh, um, families with or family members that are non-citizen uh, within these households, we uh, the the I think the literature is very clear on what's going on here is that during periods of immigration enforcement, uh, these households are facing uh, a, a decline in labor supply. Uh, 
uh, a decline in, in household earnings. And then we're also seeing something a little bit more nuanced, is, uh, which I think is also concerning, given the context of, of where we're headed in terms of labor policy throughout the entire U.S., is that workplace safety as well is, is, is being undermined during uh, periods of immigration enforcement. So one of the things that we've seen is that, uh, is that there is a decline in the number of, 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 of OSHA, uh, reporting to OSHA uh, violations uh, uh, during periods of heightened immigration enforcement. So the purpose of this study though, is to better understand what are the consequences of immigration enforcement on, on um, adolescent youth who are in uh, mixed status households particularly looking at it through the lens of labor supply. And so what we hypothesize uh, is somewhat counterintuitive. So we think that during periods of heightened immigration enforcement, that uh, U.S. born Hispanic youth are actually going to increase labor supply uh, in response to, to, to this, this immigration enforcement. Now, it's not the immigration enforcement that's actually driving, but it's a mechanism that's, ca that's causing parents um, themselves to uh, retract from the labor market and in order to smooth income during this period of heightened immigration enforcement, that what will happen is that youth will step into the labor market uh, to uh, try to, again, smooth income during this period. Um, so uh, what do we find here? Uh, well, we find, just to kind of give you a, a, a brief uh, uh, insight into this, is that uh, during periods of immigration enforcement, or heightened immigration in enforcement, we see that uh, labor force participation uh, increases by six percentage points. So that's uh, labor labor supply at the extensive margin. When we look at it at the intensive margin, so hours work, we see it increase by about 15%. Uh, so the data that we're using for this particular uh, study comes from two different sources. First, we're using immigration enforcement that is constructed at the county by month level between the periods of 2014 and 2018. Now, what we're doing is we're taking that arrest data and we are matching it to the MSA. So what that gives us is a, a, a pretty good look at, at immigration enforcement on a month-by-month -month level across, major, across every single major metropolitan area uh, within the contiguous U.S. So from this particular data, what we've developed is a shock variable that's looking at the month by month changes in arrests that extends beyond what we call the six month moving average to establish the shock. So if you read the paper, there's a lot of uh, investigation that goes into this and the robust is checked, particularly around this measure as a procedure for, as an identification strategy, particularly. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea about what the empirical framework is here, uh, uh, we are looking at, again, labor force participation, as well as labor supply measured uh, uh, in, in terms of hours worked per week. Now, we're using the shock variable, again, which is a, a standard deviation change from the six-month moving average as a de facto measure of immigration enforcement. So to keep this in mind is that we're not just looking at a policy, but we're looking at what these communities are actually uh, experiencing. And then we're using that across group variation in order to get the identification strategy nailed down in this particular model. Okay, so what do we find? So when we look at the pooled sample uh, in column one there, labor force participation, we see an increase in labor force participation by about six percentage points. Uh, for women, about eight percentage point. And for men, we don't find anything statistically significant for adolescent youth men, right? Um, when we looked at hours worked at the intensive margin, we see about a 15% increase uh, uh, for the pooled sample and then about a 20% uh, increase um, um, for women in particular. So the driving hypothesis here is that parents are leaving the labor market and then ch their children uh, who are school age are entering into the labor market. So what we do is we set up a uh, event study type analysis to look at the intra-household dynamics within this particular context. And what we find is something very startling here. So in the gray, um, in, in the gray plot, what we have here uh, is the uh, event or is the probability or proportion of, of labor supply uh, or, or, or I'm sorry, um, proportion of, 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 of labor force participation across event time. In the gray, that's the head of household or non-citizen. And in the red, that's the US born youth that's the subject of our analysis. Now, once we, the, 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 the vertical red line indicates what we call the event uh, when the shock actually occurs. So once the shock occurs, what we see is that um, the non-citizen head of household leaves the labor market or is more likely to leave the labor market 
while their U.S. born youth is more likely to enter into the labor market. So what we think that this is going on here or what we're showing evidence of is not only this intra household labor supply dynamic, but what we are thinking of is a, an added worker uh, effect that's integrated vertically within the household. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of, of what, how we're interpreting these results or give you some insights, remember, labor force participation increased by about 6%. Uh, for women, that was about 8% or 27 percentage points overall. Um, now, to give you a context, between 2014 and 2018, this is, this is roughly about 50,000 uh, um, U.S.-born youth between the ages of 14 and 18 who were induced into the labor market as a result of immigration enforcement. So these are children uh, who would have otherwise been in school, right? When we look at uh, the hours worked, we see on average about a one-hour increase in the hours worked for those who were already in the labor market. Now, this is about a, a, a 10 per, Now, this one hour represents about 10 percent of the time spent on homework uh, in, in any particular given week. Um, so just kind of situate the contributions of this study more broadly. So what we find are the unintended consequences of immigration enforcement on U.S. born youth in a kind of a counterintuitive way. That is implications about labor supply of youth, as well as bumping up against policies around uh, uh, labor protections for youth across state lines, right? Um, we develop a measure of, of, of immigration enforcement that goes beyond the de jure type policy changes uh, that we're often used to seeing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, one of the other contributions here is we're finding for the first time uh, in within the U.S. context, this underlying mechanism as an added worker effect between parents and their children, which I think is really important for us to have a better uh, insight into. So I want to thank you very much, and uh, feel free to contact me if you have any other questions. Great. Thank you so much, Joaquin. And now we will turn to Assad. Hey, folks. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to assume so. Uh, it's great to share this stage uh, with my co-panelists, and uh, it's great that they also went before me because they've done a great job of setting up the context. So I'm going to dive right in and tell you all about my most recent book, which is Engage and Evade, uh, How Latino Immigrant Families Manage Surveillance in Everyday Life. Now, one of the key assumptions guiding the book is that although immigration enforcement and deportation in particular are big, weighty, important topics to study. I also want to call attention to the fact that the threat of deportation, the possibility of deportation, is one of the more common experiences among the settled population of 10.5 million undocumented immigrants living in the United States today, uh, a majority of whom have lived here for at least 10 years, uh, many of whom have lived here for up to 20 years. And so, I think about the context of surveillance as not having experienced immigration enforcement, but living with its possibility. And more directly, I think instead about not immigration enforcement in everyday life, but these everyday forms of surveillance that most of us may not consider to be surveillance, like going to school, like taking your kids to the doctor, like going to work, like going to the bank, and I asked, ask, how is it that undocumented families with U.S.-born children understand these everyday forms of surveillance as they go about everyday life? What do these forms of surveillance mean for the relationships with the authorities in these institutions, like social workers, like doctors, even police officers? And ultimately, does it actually matter that folks are doing a decent job managing their relationship with all of these institutions as they raise them, their families and they go about their everyday lives? Does it actually help them to become U.S. citizens or at least green card holders or permanent residents in the long term? Much of the book is driven by the narrative of 28 Latino immigrant families recruited from Dallas County, Texas, starting in 2013, and I followed them over a five-year period. They were recruited based on their residential environments, sort of the, the race and class composition of their neighborhoods, and not based on their legal status. So we were only looking for families who are Latino with young children, and uh, those children had to be between the ages of three and eight. And as it so happens in Dallas County, Texas, 
when you're looking for Latino immigrant fa Latino families with young children, many of the uh, householders are themselves immigrants. And that's exactly what we found here. Um, in the households, we had about 35 undocumented immigrants, about 16 uh, DACA, TPS, or green card holders, and about four naturalized citizens, with the remainder being the US-born spouses of the various immigrants in the study. I'll also talk a little bit about how I put the in-depth interviews in conversation uh, throughout the book, but really in the back of the book. So don't worry if you're not super statty. Uh, you can look at it in the appendix of the book if you're interested. And I'll present some of those results today. And finally, I also did an ethnography of Dallas Immigration Court in 2015 to understand uh, how did immigration judges and, and uh, prosecutors who were trying to deport undocumented immigrants understand immigrants' efforts to manage surveillance in their everyday lives. And so to preview the argument, I argue that rather than think of undocumented immigrants as avoiding every facet of daily life, rather than think of them as hiding in the shadows, think of them as having a more selective engagement with the institutions that surveil them. And throughout the book, I develop a pretty simple argument, I think. Um, and the argument is that undocumented immigrants are first and foremost people. And people have multiple social roles and responsibilities that they must fulfill every day, both as parents, but also as immigrants, and in particular as immigrant parents. They're also siblings, and they themselves are children uh, to parents who they have to take care of and rely on for childcare and so on and so forth. And so a lot of times these multiple social roles and responsibilities end up mattering for how undocumented uh, families approach authorities in different institutions that surveil them. You know, I might be a professor and so I have to show myself to be competent and strong in front of the classroom so my students believe what I'm saying in the same way that undocumented immigrants, when they interact with police officers and their employers and doctors and teachers and social workers, have to show themselves to be good workers, good parents, good immigrants, and all these other kinds of social roles and responsibilities that they have. And of course, like all people, undocumented folks have to weigh the short-term risks and rewards of these everyday interactions with institutional authorities. So I may, not, may be undocumented and therefore ineligible for public benefits given federal and state constraints on my eligibility. But when I have US born kids, if they show up to school hungry and a teacher asks me why my kid did not eat breakfast that morning, I, I kind of feel that to be somewhat threatening to my caregiving in the sense that if I don't follow the teacher's recommendation and you know enroll my kid in SNAP or food assistance, perhaps then they escalate the case to child protective services, which can lead to a kind of form of family disruption or separation that's distinct from deportation that may nonetheless have cataclysmic consequences for the household. Now, where undocumented families are unique relative to sort of typical low-income families who are U.S. born in the U.S. is that they have to make all of these cost-benefit calculations about risks and rewards as they're dealing with the long-term threat of deportation, of immigration surveillance, and of possible legalization. And so they often ask themselves, does engagement today getting SNAP food assistance for my kids mean that one day I won't be eligible to get a green card or become a US citizen. And I'll show you how they think through um, these, these possibilities in a second. So I don't need to tell this audience that when you're undocumented, it's not just that you're undocumented and dealing with all of the constraints associated with that. It also means that you face a lot of overlapping hardships. You're undocumented, you're a member of a racialized ethnic group that is themselves sort of seen with suspicion in the US uh, from institutional authorities. And you're also poor because you can't access uh, high paying jobs with good benefits and such to take care of your children and or, or let alone yourself. And uh, in many cases, this is not lost on the folks that I interviewed in the study. Eduardo, who has spent 20 years in the US put it very simply, saying that no one in the country pays us a lot. You can find work, but you're not going to earn as much as someone who's from here. We come here and give it our all. We struggle, we suffer, and we get no help from anyone.
Alejandra sort of has a similar sentiment. She spent 16 years in the U.S. working alongside her husband, setting up and taking down bouncy houses for children's birthday parties throughout Dallas County. And essentially, they're paid in cash, and they have to save for those inevitable days when rain comes and winter rolls into Texas, of all places, and bouncy houses are no longer viable. Samuel makes the point that it's, you know, they, he can find work, he can use these papeles chuecos, these false identity documents to secure work, but he knows that that work is not stable. But at the end of the day, some work is better than no work. And he says, you have to be okay with what you have, but you do still dream of more, of not living day to day, you know? And so many of the folks in the study avoided different kinds of institutions that offered public assistance simply because they were not eligible for those uh, services. And of course, there are other kinds of food banks and such that we can talk about. But for the most part, it wasn't until parents in the study became pregnant that they started to engage with things like hospitals and clinics and other kinds of health centers. And it's normally because people would go there with to these clinics with stomach pain, and the stories were very similar. They'd find out that they were pregnant, and then a nurse or other house, healthcare social worker would come and enroll them in the children's health insurance program that provides prenatal care for pregnant parents, as well as postnatal care for up to two visits once the baby is born. And eventually, you know, the kid, so long as the household meets uh, income eligibility requirements, the kid remains enrolled until the age of 18. And that's exactly what happened with Norma and Natalia, two undocumented immigrants who stayed out of the system until they became pregnant. And then they were enrolled in the Children's Health Insurance Program, WIC, uh, as well, among food assistance, among other programs as well. And so, of course, we're all aware that burdening the government is a big worry among undocumented immigrants who worry about being classified as a public charge. Adriana, who has been in the U.S. for 21 years, put it very simply and said, many people say you shouldn't ask for help, but if the children were born here, they have a right to health insurance, and thank God they get it. I even signed them up for food assistance because I'm not rich. The children need health insurance. Imagine what would happen if they got sick or didn't have enough food to eat. How would I pay for their medical expenses? How would I pay for their doctor's visits when I take them for their checkups? And how am I supposed to pay for their food? So she's asking these fundamental questions about subsistence of, of survival. And in the end of, at the end of the day, she says, she's not super worried about being classified as a public charge because she's lived in the US for 21 years and she doesn't know that she'll ever have that opportunity at this point. And she says, I hear people say it will affect me. I don't know if they wanna scare us or are trying to warn us if it's true or a lie, but there's no time to stop and worry. The children were born here and it's my job to take care of them however I can. So for Adriana, she's willing to risk a potential future opportunity at legalization in order to avoid the everyday forms of surveillance that she's dealing with in her local community. And this also extends to the fathers in the study. Pedro, who's been here for 23 years, has five US born daughters, said something similar, and it's very simple. Again, if I don't take my kids to the doctor or send them to school, the police come for them. So here he's more worried about these everyday authorities and less worried about immigration authorities as he's raising his kids in the US. Like Adriana, he says he hopes to get his papers one day, and he knows that he's risking it by being enrolling his kids in the Children's Health Insurance Program and food assistance, uh, among other programs. But he said, but they would have given me papers by now if they were going to do that. And besides, none of this help is for us. It's for us. It's for our girls. He takes a beat and he tells me that there, is, there are no laws against us getting these things for our kids. All this to say, the selective engagement that these families endure, the uh, selective engagement with these different institutions that these families uh, report, are coming from these overlapping hardships that they face as undocumented immigrants in the US, especially when it comes to the well being of their children. And so they try their best to minimize their engagement on their own behalf. Like, I might not go to the doctor for myself, but I'll take my kid to the doctor to ensure that they're well taken care of. 
And so, you know, I'm a teach, I'm a professor first and foremost. And so I tell my students, this is a testable implication. You can take these data, these interview data and say, okay, in this, in this case, we should expect to see that Latino non-citizens are perhaps less involved in these different institutions uh, when it comes to their own involvement, when you compare them to the US born citizens. But between the US born citizens who are parents and the, and the non-citizens who are, who are parents, we should see similar forms of involvement um, in, in national data. And so I'll skip some of the details. In, there's a, a very detailed analysis in the back of the book, but otherwise I weave this into the narrative. And of course, if you're just looking in a, on a at a typical day in a typical year in national data, you do see that Latino non-citizens have lower average rates of involvement in these institutions, hospitals, banks, schools, and the workplace when you compare them with their US born peers, but when you control for you know, gender and class and all these other things that you might think are associated, you don't find any evidence of a significant difference between these two groups. And that doesn't mean that you know, non-citizenship doesn't matter, but it does tell me that there are correlated characteristics associated with non-citizenship, like being poor, like being a racialized ethnic minority, like being undocumented, that kind of all work together to explain some of the big differences that we observe on an everyday basis. When you look at parents, uh, only parents, and you say, how involved are they? Of course, when it comes to parents' own involvement for their own behalf, are they going to work? Are they going to the hospitals? You do see that parents who are non-citizens are less involved on, over, on average when compared with the US born. But when you add in the time they spend involved in these different institutions on behalf of their kids, you actually don't find a statistically significant difference there, suggesting that children are a key conduit through which parents become involved in everyday institutions. And then if you look at non-parents, you find something similar, which is that there's pretty it's, it's pretty standard across the board. Non-parents who are US born citizens and non-citizens are not varying their time. Um, and that's in part because they have a lot of time to spend in work. And so a lot of this is driven by their investments in work, even as they're sort of less, the non-citizens are less involved in, in hospitals and, and clinics like that. So I'll wrap up here and, and just say that I think throughout the book uh, of surveillance is both about being about punishment and reward. And we should think about the avoidance of specific interactions within institutions rather than avoiding institutions wholesale because I think that reveals to us where these social roles and responsibilities end up mattering for folks. And I also make an argument that uh, undocumented families are very similar to low-income families more generally in the United States, and probably less similar to people who are on the run from the police, like those with outstanding arrest warrants or parole violations, uh, which is a big conversation in sociology that I'm, I'm having. And then finally, I make a point that it's good that these undoc that these mixed status families are involved in these different institutions. I think these institutions provide them resources and allow their children to do well in life. But I also make the point throughout the book, sorry about that, I make the point throughout the book that some of this engagement is coming from a coercive uh, place, that they're worried about how they're perceived by doctors and teachers and social workers. And so even as it's good that people are involved, I do want to say that they are worried about family separation. They are worried about CPS involvement. They are worried about police involvement, even as their everyday concerns may not necessarily revolve around immigration enforcement. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about policy solutions throughout uh, the Q&A, but thank you all for your time. And I look forward to a, a conversation. Thank you so much, Asad, for that presentation. And we'll welcome back Michael and Joaquin for the Q&A. Uh, there have been some questions in the live Q&A that have been answered as we've gone along, and, and we might be able to weave some of those in too. Um, I want to start with a question that uh, I think all of you might have something to, to say about, but I'm going to ask um, Asad and Joaquin maybe to start. So. It's a very complex and rapidly changing nature of US immigration policies and their impacts on the lives of immigrants without legal status. The question is in particular, how do these immigrants 
try to understand and stay on top of the changing policies and what do their information sources and ecosystems about immigration policy, about enforcement look like? Asad, would you like to start? Yeah, thanks, uh, Judith. I, I'd say for a lot of the people in my study, much of the initial impetus to become involved in these different institutions is coming from people on their network. So one of my respondents said, oh yeah, my sister was pregnant before me and she told me that I could go get this children's health insurance program and it would be no problem. And so that's great, uh, but at the same time, it's sort of this informal kind of arrangement is something that we should not rely on. Uh, the other thing though is, and I think this is actually good and unexpected in the Dallas, Texas context is that they make available social workers, very helpful social workers across a range of civil society organizations. And so sometimes, you know, a, a social worker shows up to a doctor's appointment and says, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're eligible for these things. Let us help you. And again, I think that's good. But I also think that depending on the context of how you approach the person and their legal status, I also think that that can be somewhat coercive. Like they may not necessarily understand, you know, the possibility of the, the risks that they and their families are facing. So I think it's good to institutionalize these efforts. I think my preference would be to institutionalize them with uh, immigrant serving nonprofits to allow people the opportunity to sort of calmly digest their, uh, their available options rather than sort of compel their options immediately within, um, you know, a hospital setting, for example, or even a school setting. Thank you for that. Joaquin, how do you see this information sharing or, um, or information ecosystem playing out with these families where you're seeing the undocumented parent perhaps leaving the workforce, the the natural, the, the US born child entering the workforce. How is that information getting shared in within the communities? Yeah, so I think social media, WhatsApp, I think is is it's uh, being shared. Um, I think it's I think it's most important to to recognize that in terms of the U.S. immigration system itself, there hasn't been a lot of like really big changes um, since the administration. What we've had are, are a lot of institutions of, of like omnibus type policies or 287G and secure communities. These are facilitating immigration enforcement. And a lot of that is driven by executive order. So you're, you're going to see a lot of changes in policy that's happening uh, in, in, in not necessarily in big ways, but in like, for instance, uh, targeting pregnant women or, or, or not targeting pregnant women or separating uh, zero tolerance policies and things like this. And, and that is really concerning because that means that from one presidential administration to the next, you're going to have a lot of variations in just how tense the immigration enforcement is, but not evenly distributed across the U.S., re really uh, geographically specific, um, depending on, on where, what the target is. And Michael, I wonder if you have seen evidence of how aware people are of the level of interaction or cooperation between, say, ICE and the local police police force. How are how how aware are people of maybe what their level of risk might be? Um, in terms of so, the short answer is people are quite aware in the sense of like, I, I doubt if you ask people really specifics in terms of like, tell me exactly how this 287G program works, or is this a jail enforcement model? Or is this a, you know, parole enforcement model or something like that? That strikes me as a level of specificity that you often don't see. But just to give an example of secure communities, I mean, part of the reason, I mean, you actually had the Department of Homeland Security say, uh, so that program was actually shelved in 2014. It was replaced by PEP, which was the priority enforcement program. And um, it changed a little bit of their sort of priorities. So that's, they, they changed their priorities. But the core nucleus of that program was still the same. The reason why they changed the name is because it had such a stigma about it. it the, if you say secure communities, it was, it, there was an overall negative sense of what that was doing to communities. So the short answer is people are often aware when these programs roll out. Um, they're often aware of, um, okay, the, the police are now you know, collaborating in a way. Again, but they're almost certainly not aware of exactly what the details are, but but certainly when ESCOM, again, and especially because ESCOM was so new, like it really was a, a, an absolute game changer in sort of how 
we enforced immigration laws. And so there, there's there's certainly a uh, there's definitely evidence to suggest that uh, people were very much aware. And that's why you saw so much public pushback against programs like specifically actually not even programs like specifically program uh, of secure communities. Does that help answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. And actually, Michael, we'll stay with you for a moment. Um, we had a couple questions that I think are related. The question was, are there approaches to enforcement that cause less harm, relatively speaking? And where in the U.S. might there be policing and immigration practices that welcome rather than further traumatize newcomers? And what can we learn from them? And can we scale up those approaches if they exist? Sure. So in terms of the, again, we, we do, the we definitely find that ESCOM exacerbated disparities in case processing for non-U.S. citizens, right? And so at least in Texas. And so it's funny, I, I've been asked this question, essentially, what are the sort of political ramifications of my research? And I think uh, I think there's two aspects. One is I think if you were to ask, again, I'll just, I'm speculating, but, I, but I, I feel fairly confident. If you were to ask Greg Abbott about these results, I think he would say this is exactly what we wanted the program to be. Um, see, look, we're not targeting racial minorities. And in fact, what, what we're doing is we're making life difficult for, for non-U.S. citizens. And again, some proportion of those in that data would absolutely be undocumented. Um, so that is one. So again, if you're in Texas, I think Texas lawmakers would look at that and say, this is a, you know, this is a useful program. You know, we're making life difficult for people. Um, but again, I think the, the sort of the, the uh, encouraging news from California is that state level sort of uh, policies and sort of normative stances around we are not going to, again, California judges care whether or not you commit crimes. California prosecutors care whether or not you commit crimes. What they don't necessarily care about is that you did it while undocumented or you did it as a someone with a tenuous legal status. And what I find um, and uh, what I find in other work, too, is that um, those policies seem to matter, right? Is that, again, when ESCOM washed over the state of California, like it did other states, it didn't seem to affect either the arrest of uh, who uh, police were arresting, and it didn't seem to affect how they process cases. And so what that means is, is that just because the federal government places a heavy emphasis on individuals who have a, a run-in with the law as a sort of high, uh, prioritizing them for removal, you need not change your criminal justice practices. And what I find is that California, at least in terms of disparities, seem to not have, right? In fact, they, they, they've really gone the other way. I mean, just the most dramatic example would be is California statutorily redefined what a misdemeanor was. Um, so now all misdemeanors in the state of California is only 364 days. And they did this explicitly with the goal of ensuring that somebody who was convicted of only a misdemeanor would not face immigration consequences. Because under federal law, anybody who was uh, punished, uh, who was convicted of a crime that could be sentenced to a year or more, which included virtually all misdemeanors, um, could be eligible for deportation. And so uh, in that sense, like I said, there's, uh, I would say, um, you know, for really staunch immigration enforcement individuals, I think they would find something to like in the Texas results. And I think for people who are very much concerned about sort of the increasing uh, 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 encroachment of immigration enforcement and various other aspects of life, including local law enforcement, I think they would they should find the results from California encouraging as well. Great. Thank you for that. Asad, I'm going to ask you to start off with this one. There's so much talk about what social service safety net programs are available for, say, U.S. born children, regardless of the status of parents or for parents or for families who are mixed status. What social safety net resources are available to non-citizens? And the question is, how do we reduce fears of repercussions for non-citizens to use these resources? And because we have so many great practitioners here on the call, there is a question, are there ways that they might unintentionally be putting their clients in a situation where they might be at risk? Yeah, thank you, Judith. I mean, this is a big question and it really depends unfortunately on where you live. But I'll say as a general rule, if your, ch if your household meets income eligibility guidelines within your state and uh, the kid is a U.S. born child, uh, more often than not, they are the kid individually is eligible for most benefits, for all benefits as a U.S. citizen, um, even as the parent is not. And so, you know, getting food assistance, enrolling that kid in public health insurance, um, WIC, basically any, even disability insurance for the kid is completely acceptable and appropriate. And many of the families in my study were dealing with that. 
Where it becomes much more complicated is on behalf of the parent who may be undocumented. They may not be individually eligible for a lot of things. Like, you know, one thing that they might be eligible for if a, if a, a, if a physician agrees would be like emergency Medicaid. If you're dealing with breast cancer or any kind of other sort of threatening life diagnosis. But that is a very subjective threshold to reach, right? Who counts for emergency Medicaid? Who is allowed to get that? And so often I think the better alternative is that, you know, is to create uh, programs that are about low income status within hospitals. So there in, in Texas, there are various hospitals that serve low income patients regardless of legal status. They don't even ask for legal status. Within Dallas itself, all you have to do is have an income a uh, household income below a certain level. And all of a sudden you can basically have regular doctor checkups in the same way that someone with health insurance would. Maybe you're paying 20 bucks a visit. And so thinking about these indigent services on behalf of uh, undocumented folks may be a good way forward. You know, Joaquin said this earlier, but depending on the administration that's in charge and what rules are proposed, Right now, you know, the Trump administration did try to change the public charge rule to penalize undocumented families whose U.S. born kids were receiving some kind of public assistance. Um, that rule was ended up being very narrow in scope, affecting a tiny sliver of visa holders um, and even green card hold a very tiny sliver of green card holders. And so, you know, I think it's it's hard for me to say what's going to happen in the next couple of years. But my sense would be that it's probably best for you all to not try to predict what will happen and focus on what is happening. And right now, a lot of the things that are available are available to the kids who are U.S. born citizens. And so make that understanding that the situation can change. And if the situation does change, then we can we can pivot. Thank you for that. I, I want to let Joaquin or Michael add anything there if you'd like to. No. All right. Well, we could go on for a lot longer, but we are just about at time. So I want to thank Michael Light, Joaquin Rubalcaba, and Asad Asad for sharing their time, experience, and research with us today, and to Don Duran and Natea Taylor for handling the tech for the webinar. As we mentioned before, we'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and you'll all receive a link to those by mail. There was also a question about, will you hear about upcoming webinars? You absolutely will. You are now on our list and we'd be happy to have you join us again. Thank you all for coming today and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Bye everyone.